He was one of the best people in Canada. Very nice, very humanitarian man. He was so proud of us, like we would be his own children. That's the voice of the late Moishe Javerson, and he was one of the first group of Polish Jewish orphans to arrive in Canada 94 years ago this summer. The man who brought him here was Morris Sachs, a Jewish farmer from Georgetown, Ontario, just north of Toronto. In the late 1920s, Sachs convinced the Canadian government to open the doors to 79 Jewish teens from one particular orphanage in Masaryk, Poland, as long as they came to train to be farmers. There's a new book out about Sachs and his youthful protégés. Sachs's family calls their grandfather a Canadian schindler. And to make this story even more amazing, guess which Canadian government official helped Sachs bring these kids to Canada? Only probably the most hated man in Jewish-Canadian history, the man who kept Jewish refugees out of the country in the 30s and 40s by saying none is too many, yep, Frederick Charles Blair. He had a, a special relationship with my grandfather, and they both wanted the same thing. They wanted to teach kids how to farm. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Wednesday, July 7th, 2021. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. The new book is called Jacob and the Mandolin Adventure, and it tells the story of some of the orphans and their perilous journey to a new life as trainee farmers, thanks to the generosity of Morris Sachs. Sachs was a successful farmer who himself had come to Canada in 1902. He was one of the founders of Beth Tzedek Synagogue in Toronto, and he believed Jews shouldn't be peddlers or jobbers, but they should work the land, just like the thousands of Jewish immigrants did in the farming colonies in Western Canada. Sachs and his family housed and trained the orphans for several years until a corrupt business partner took too many kickbacks and the Canadian government shut the scheme down. Until now, Sachs's efforts had largely been forgotten by history. There isn't even a plaque in the area of the farm school where they all lived. Coming up, I'll speak with Morris Sachs's grandson and with the author of the book. But first, here's what's making news in Canada right now. The first Canadian victim of the condo collapse in Surfside, Florida, has been identified. She was 66-year-old Itty Ainsworth, a Jewish woman formerly of Montreal. Her maiden name was Felig. Her parents were Holocaust survivors and part of the city's Lubavitch community. Itty met her husband Svi Ainsworth while he was visiting Montreal. He was from Australia. After the wedding, the couple moved to Australia, where they lived until moving to Florida to be closer to their children and grandchildren. Funeral services were held Tuesday in New York for both Itty and her 68-year-old husband. The cortege passed by the world headquarters of the Chabad movement on the way to the cemetery in Queens, where Itty's father is buried. He was a Belzer rabbi. Itty's mother, Miriam, is still alive. She's 89 and lives in Florida. Ontario's government is giving a Jewish group the nod to train public school teachers this summer about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. The education minister made the announcement Monday. The Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Centre in Toronto will receive $375,000 to hire staff and create new programs for teacher training and for students. They'll hear Holocaust survivor testimonies, they'll learn about genocide, human rights, and how to recognize anti-Semitism on social media. Ontario says it's part of an effort to help Jewish students feel safe when they return to in-person public school in the fall. And now to the incredible story, but unknown one, of a giant of a man with a humanitarian heart. It's just been published as a book, and joining me now from Toronto are Morris Sachs's grandson, David Fleishman, and Anne Dublin, the author. You called yourself, your, your film, David, um, a man of conscience, and, you know, you've compared him to Canada's Schindler. It sounds a bit corny, but when I, you know, when I saw the movie Schindler's List, I said, I have to, I have a story to tell. And... Because it's it's got something that uh, you know it's really got universal appeal. Same as same thing goes for for Anne's book: immigration, um, discrimination, refugees seeking a safe haven and a sense of belonging. They're all really relevant today in Canada and the states. So it's something that all immigrants can relate to, and we need more people like that out there and more stories like this. I think, you know. 
You know, Ellen, um, one of the things, one of the facts that really struck me when I was doing the research is um, between the two world wars, there were about 20,000 Jews in the town of Meserich, where these orphans came from in Poland. By the end of the war, 75 Jews had survived from that original population because most of the Jews were sent directly to the death camps. Uh, they didn't even have a chance really to go to a labor camp or a concentration camp. They went directly, most of them, to Treblinka. So as the daughter of Holocaust survivors, you know, that really touched my heart, that fact. And I kept thinking that if Morris Sachs hadn't provided a home, a safe place um, for these Jewish orphans to come to, they most likely would have perished. And also how many how many kids were born from the original 79, you know, so that's a good thing. I Do you know, know how many? No, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know how to how I'd even figure that out. But are any know. of the 79 still alive today? No. When I made the movie in 1996, we had, I think, five of the orphans and they were 85 years old back then. So they're all gone. You know, one of the things that shocked me when I read it was that Frederick Charles Blair was not the villain in this story. He was actually your grandfather's supporter, which would shock Canadians who've read None Is Too Many. Yeah, well, Anne's book, uh, you know, she's coming at it from a different angle because it's a fictional piece. And there, I guess there's no need to uh, mention Blair in that. And a lot of people don't like to talk about these things. But, you know, as a journalist and a historian, and when you do research, you deal with facts. So when I did the movie, I came across, I got about over 400 documents and letters from the Ministry of Immigration, um, and they're in the National Archives. And it, there was a lot of information about this guy, uh, Blair. And um, he, I, yeah, he was an anti-Semite, but I guess he, he had a, a special relationship with my grandfather, and they both wanted the same thing. They wanted to teach kids how to farm because that was the only way you could bring kids over. So, you know, I guess they had their own agendas, right? And they had to play the game a little. I think that um, Blair had a special relationship with Morris Sachs, not only because Morris was a farmer, but also Morris had served um, during First World War as a, a translator or an interpreter. And so Blair had a lot of respect for Morris, and, and that built up the, the trust. But, you know, it wasn't 100%. Uh, there were a lot of conditions that went along with letting these uh, Jewish orphans come into Canada. And the minute, maybe I could say even the second, these conditions were broken, then the whole scheme started to fall apart. Right. So this Greenblatt fellow who owned the orphanage in Ms. Rich, um, the first group that came over, they were legitimate orphans in 1927. The second group came over in 29, and Greenblatt saw a way to make money, and he didn't bring over orphans. He lied to my grandfather. He brought, went to wealthy families, Jewish families in Europe, and charged them, and this is all documented, between $400 and $600, he pocketed the money. In the meantime, my grandfather's laying out his own money to try and keep it going. But, uh, you know, after a few months of talking with the orphans, he found out that he had been fooled, you know. So that it's kind of sad, that part about it, because we'll never know how it, it could have ended up, you know. Uh, when this ended in 33, and then the later years, at, you know, at the end of the war, my grandfather tried to re reopen the farm school, and he couldn't partly due to what had been done in the past, I guess. It's an amazing, amazing story and an amazing Canadian. It should have its literally a plaque, definitely, in Georgetown needs to be done. Yeah. Is that something you want to do, you guys, now that the story is coming out, you know, more broadly? Let's do it, Dave. 
Let's I do need, it. I, yeah, we need a plaque. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if if we think about Canadian heroes, never mind Canadian Jewish heroes, but just Canadian heroes, yeah. I put Morris Sachs up there, right there on the list. Because, you know, we talk now about social justice, about being a humanitarian. He was it. He was the epitome of it. Um, he, through his actions, he saved all these, these um, poor orphans uh, so they could learn a trade, make a living, and become um, valuable citizens of Canada. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, also, I don't mean to preach, but I mean, if anyone is a hero in my book, Morris Sachs is. One more cool thing in the book. Spoiler alert, the orphans were also mandolin players, and the book tells about how they eventually traveled to New York to play a concert at the famous Carnegie Hall in 1928. Morris Sachs died in Toronto in 1965, and his grandson David's documentary, called A Man of Conscience, was shown on the CBC in the 1990s. And you can watch it on YouTube. I've put the link in the show notes. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Our listener shout-out today goes to Esther Kulik of Toronto, who says she likes the CJN Daily because she gets it directly via the CJN newsletter. You can too. Just sign up or send me your email, and I'll send you the link on how to do it. I'm at ebesner at the cjn.ca. And we'll close the episode with a sneak peek from an upcoming show. If you're feeling anxious about being out of lockdown and having to meet up with real people again, we've got some advice from an expert. So it's super important when you're when you're reconnecting with friends to try and let yourself be real with those people about how you're feeling, how this past year has been for you, instead of trying to, you know, block that away and just engage in a more superficial level. 